Watch this. Immigration reform, certainly not a problem solved in just one day. Neither can the discussion about it be contained to just one day. You had a lot of comments and questions about our look into Idaho's farm worker situation and how to fix it. So we're continuing the conversation today. After invasive mussels muscled their way into Idaho's waterways, we were told it would take something strong to get rid of them. Too strong for the fish? We now have an idea of what else was eliminated. Fall isn't over just yet, but the colors that come with it, well, they won't last the whole season. So we're gonna take a moment to enjoy the beauty all around us. We passed it twice in the house the last two years. We almost had it done uh, on the omnibus last year, but we just couldn't get it across the finish line. So we're trying again this year. Is it your friends over in the Senate not meeting you halfway? Well, we sent it over to them and they just didn't get it passed. They didn't get it put on the omnibus or they didn't get it passed individually. I think if it comes up on the Senate floor, there's enough of us to pass it. So we'll see. We will see. And that's just part of the interview we showed you yesterday about the worst kept secret in Idaho's ag industry. The vast majority of workers are foreign born. And when it comes to Idaho's dairy industry, well, that vast majority becomes a virtual entirety. 90% of workers come from outside this country, according to Idaho's Dairymen Association. Without a year round work visa program, it's no secret that most of these jobs are filled by undocumented immigrants, which is why Idaho Congressman Mike Simpson is trying to push through legislation to reform the farm worker visa program. He wants to account for the workers that are already here and have a way to keep track of the workers that will inevitably come in the future. The stories we shared yesterday prompted a lot of feedback from, from you, our viewers, like, like this one from Carmen. We need to take better care of our farm workers. I would happily pay more for milk and produce if it meant the money would help ensure basic human rights, not line some CEO's pockets. Thanks for covering this, she said. To solve the problem, Kelly suggests putting three dairy farmers, three restaurant owners, and three dirt farmers in a room for five days, and they would come up with a U.S. policy that would work. No way the Republicans and Democrats solve this, she says. And there was this question from Steve. So if the House has twice passed the Farm Workforce Modernization Act bill, why hasn't the Senate put it up for a vote? And Anna, she asked the same, same thing. Why haven't Crapo and Risch helped to get Simpson's bill passed in the Senate? Which brings us back to Congressman Simpson interview we just showed you. The Farm Worker Modernization Act has passed the House twice, yes, in 2019 and 2021. Yet it's gone nowhere in the Senate. They've never even voted on it, which also brings us back to Andrew Bartline, who covered for this for us yesterday. So I guess the question is, is this true? Is Congressman Simpson working alone on this? Not necessarily, and he certainly has some help from the rest of his congressional delegation here in Idaho, Brian. And when we spoke with him, he says, well, when we spoke with him, it was because, I should say, he's been the most vocal about this issue amongst the delegation. So he sort of served as a spokesperson for sorts in that initial story. It's part of a larger bipartisan group that is pushing this forward, and it's highlighted this year by a team of 10 representatives who introduced this bill reintroduced it again for the third time. There's four Republicans and six Democrats that come from Washington, Idaho, California, New York, and Texas. So it goes coast to coast. But once this passed the House most recently in 21, it stalled almost immediately because that same bipartisan success they had in the House, or at least a compromise, they couldn't replicate that over in the Senate. File through an Idaho field and find clear-cut work that needs to be done. This issue is, is a great example of how democracy can be messy. Messy, especially around the white collars and a notable lack of rolled up sleeves. Rick Nairbouts, I... <sighs> he's tracked the backroom banner from the beginning. You know, a very bipartisan effort. Bidding on behalf of the Idaho Dairymen's Association. Whose responsibility was it to move this once it was the Senate's job and why did it ultimately not move. We had Senator Crapo take the lead as a Republican negotiator, working with his Democratic counterpart, uh, Senator Bennett from Colorado. And so the two of them worked in earnest to try and negotiate a bill, but Senator Crapo did not feel that what they had could be brought to the Senate floor and, and have found 60 votes at the time. Nairbout says that relationship is where a potential compromise began to break down. On one side, dairy owners were willing to register all future workers through E-Verify. 
program that effectively ensures no undocumented workers can slip through the cracks. In return, they asked for a visa program that would ensure a steady supply of workers to fill those job openings. And, and really, the, the major sticking point was number of visas. You had Senator Crapo, who's you know, a very conservative Republican, advocating that, hey, my farmers in my district, you know, the dairymen, the farmers I represent, they need more visas to make sure that they have enough workers to fill the jobs available. You know, there's a tremendous amount of irony in that, that you had a re conservative Republican saying, we need some more visas here, and the Democrats saying, nah, sorry, I don't think we can go along with that. If I was a betting man, I would almost flip those. That doesn't sound like that fits correctly in my head, so why is it that way? So if you're United Farm Workers Union, you realize that all these workers that are gonna come in on this H-2A visa, they don't need to be dues-paying members of their union because those issues are all addressed in the visa. And, and what's played out in this is United Farm Workers Union uh, definitely had the ear of Senator Bennett. A push to limit visas pushed the negotiation to its limit. But the deeper problem between labor and production doesn't have the same luxury to crumble. But did it feel that there's a window that's almost closing a little bit? I mean, honestly, it's felt like the window's been closed the entirety of this Congress. Closed for business, with work still left to be done. Over the next decade, the decision we're going to have to make as a state and as a country is do we want to import the workers or do we want to import our food? And that very much is a national security conversation because as soon as you become dependent upon another country to feed your own population, then you've got risk when it comes to national security. While the bill has been reintroduced this year, it hasn't moved in the House either. Again, saying he feels like that window's been closed this whole uh, session. The Idaho Dairymen's Association says the makeup of Congress going forward plays a large role in that, and if this kind of legislation is going to get support. Brian, it seems that a more moderate Republican mm -hmm. seems to be someone that they would find success with getting yes votes on it. But again, it has been bipartisan efforts, needing Democrats as well to side with them and decide this is something we like to see. Again, six Democrats, four Republicans introducing it. So it is bipartisan by nature. But he, what he's saying is, in essence, a union has killed this bill so far. That's what he says. The Idaho Dairymen's Association, their understanding is that the Democrat that was supposed to work with Crapo uh, was more interested in limiting visas because there's a union that's in his ear saying, we don't get H-2A workers in our union because they're covered by the H-2A bill saying that they need housing, they need homes with lights and yeah. water, and that's supplied through the bill through the employer. So the union for H-2A workers, they don't need them. You can see why the dairy farmer you spoke with yesterday is like, I'm tired of the rhetoric. Let's yeah. just do something on this, and right now it is not. Don't go anywhere, because okay. we got a lot of comments and questions that we didn't have a chance to share or answer yesterday. So we're going to take on some of those right now. Some of those you're going to have to help us with here, Andrew. Dan in Boise texted in, one season without these farm workers, and I'll bet some politicians would sing a different song. Chris and Meridian added to the conversation saying, I grew up in Emmett and am well aware of how valuable they are in bringing food to our communities. I am always frustrated by people's prejudices against them, as in the migrant farm workers, and perplexed by our local politicians' inability or unwillingness to fix the immigration and workforce issues. John pointed out, it isn't just an ag job that rely on foreign-born workers. American workers don't show up in food manufacturing and others related to agriculture. I mean, have you checked out the kitchen of your favorite local restaurant lately? George adds, I'll hand this one over to you, Andrew, because this is a question you might have to deal with. Simpson cannot pass a law that <laughs> violates existing law. You cannot make illegals documented citizens and he's saying, Mike is saying that's the federal law. George is saying that. I, yeah, I got bad news for you, Mike. That's the job of a federal lawmaker is to kind create of. new laws. And if a new law is never made, then the law is like written in stone, right? But right. we know that's not how it works. Our law is a living document. You can look at something like Roe versus Wade, right? Well, it would be, you can't strike that down, right? That's law. Well, a court decided, no, it's not. This is now the new law. So with the lawmakers themselves, they can make new laws and say this is how it works. Changing with the times and yeah. quarterly and all Things that. Things can always change. They're always living documents. Exactly. So he's not just trying to do this all on his own, by the way. Rhonda and Starr, let's go for this uh, one more here. Rhonda and Starr says she works in a food bank where many of the workers come in for food and their families. She says they don't make enough money to buy food and they stay in shelter. She tells the story of one family who was only offered a beat up trailer to live uh, and, and by, offered this by a farmer, by the way. And this trailer had no water 
or no electricity. So the question to you, Andrew, would, this, would conditions like this be allowed under this updated H-2A program? Yeah, so if they did put this H-2A reform through, people who are already living here, who are undocumented workers, mm -hmm. they could be gathered into this, and the idea is to gather them into it. And if they are an H-2A worker, well, at that point, then the housing is uh, provided to them by their employer. It gets inspected regularly by the federal government. Plumbing, water, heating and cooling. I mean, there are very strict regulations. I mean, it has to be up to code. You need smoke right. detectors, fire extinguishers, first aid kits. And so these undocumented workers being taken advantage of in a situation like that, well, this reform would prevent that from happening. Okay, so here we sit, still waiting for that to happen because, well, we're still waiting for something else to happen in the House of Representatives. Thank you, Andrew. So what's the best way to make sure the Farm Worker Modernization Act gets another shot in the House of Representatives? Well, it might best be determined by who's actually running the House. Today, Congressman Jim Jordan lost his first bid to be the next Speaker of the House. And one of the 20 Republicans voting against Jordan in that first effort, Idaho Congressman Mike Simpson, who voted for Congressman Steve Scalise instead. And after that vote, Simpson called out the eight so-called Republicans who voted to oust Speaker McCarthy just a few weeks ago without a plan for what happens after their destructive vote. Instead, it's just stalled our critical appropriations process, he says, paralyzed the House's legislative business and left Republicans looking like we are incapable of governing. Simpson said he made it clear a couple weeks ago he would vote for the favored Republican nominee at the time, which is why he voted for House Majority Leader Scalise from Louisiana today instead of Jordan, because he felt Scalise deserved at least the opportunity to be considered by the full House. Simpson was one of seven to vote for Scalise, by the way. Jordan needs 217 votes to get the gavel, and he only got 200 today. One of those votes, yes, was from Idaho Congressman Russ Fulcher. Democratic nominee and House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, well, he got 212 votes. So I guess we're told they're going to try again tomorrow to make this happen. Meanwhile, the Idaho GOP, the party of the majority party of the state of Idaho, well, they had something to say about Simpson's vote today. Profound disappointment, disheartening, political games, Protest votes. Those were just some of the phrases used to describe Simpson and his stand today. Chairwoman Dorothy Moon saying the party has been inundated with emails and phone calls and wrote Simpson's vote for a January 6th apologist is emphasizing the, quote, same message as the radical Democrat members of the House, end quote. She went on to say, the people of Idaho expect Mike Simpson to represent their concerns and prioritize their needs above political games and partisan divisions. Wrapping up the release with, we will be watching. Does Congressman Mike Simpson not represent his constituents' concerns? I mean, after all, didn't Congressman Simpson win the Republican primary last year with 55% of the vote and the general election by 63% of the vote? Didn't we all watch that happen? Idaho, well, actually, Idaho Snake River, that's been under invasion for the past couple of months from quagga mussels. They were found in a section of the Snake River near Twin Falls back in mid-September. The quagga mussels do a lot of damage to waterways and the wildlife within them. So by October 3rd, Idaho State Department of Agriculture started to aggressively get rid of these things. Over the next 10 days, they dumped thousands of gallons of copper-based formula called Natrix. They dumped it right into the Snake River. Agency officials told us the treatment wouldn't actually poison the fish in the river, but instead it just prevent them from being able to take oxygen out of the water, kind of suffocating them, which would mean a lot of fish would likely die, a quote, significant number, according to Idaho Fish and Game. And they were right, except the Department of Ag, well, they weren't able to tell us an exact number today. They did say the fish most commonly killed were common carp, northern yellow pike, and some sturgeon. So now the question is, did the treatment actually work on the mussels? The deputy director for uh, ISDA, Lloyd Knight, says it may take a while to get that answer, but he says the treatment is, a go is going according to plan. So our rapid response plan provides for us to go through five years of negative surveys before we can change the status of the water body from positive to negative. Um, we'll sure feel better after the initial season, a full season next year. If we don't get any hits, we'll start to feel better that, that maybe our observations are verified by that. Uh, but certainly uh, the observations during treatment uh, told us that the treatment was having the desired effect. Um, these initial surveys that we do in the next week or two will give us an initial indication. Um, but it is, it's kind of a long wait game at this point, not a quick answer. And here's the part that may impact you. Knight says there are some changes coming later this week to the current closures in place for that stretch of the river. Department of Ag, as well as Fish and Game, they're going to update their closures. 
between Twin Falls Dam and Augur Falls. So be aware of that. The agencies also expect to implement decontamination stations when they eventually open more of that water for recreation. several other things going on around the 208 and so you won't miss out on news about those things like an indictment an update on missing woman and more movement out at the Boise Airport. Well, here's Morgan Romero with the 411. A former Caldwell police sergeant was arrested in Tennessee today, indicted on charges of sexually abusing women and exchanging favorable police treatment for sexual favors. Ryan Bendewald was indicted here in Idaho. Seven investigates first reported these allegations in March of 2022, as the FBI investigated Bendewald and other Caldwell officers. The U.S. Attorney's Office says Bendewald is accused of violating at least seven women's civil rights and abusing his position as a law enforcement officer over the course of several years. Bendewald is charged with two felony counts of deprivation of rights under color of law, five felony counts of federal program bribery, and one misdemeanor count of deprivation of rights under color of law. If he's found guilty on all charges, he faces up to life in prison. Another high-ranking Caldwell cop, Joey Hoadley, was convicted of three federal felonies last fall. His case also stemming from that FBI investigation into misconduct within the police department. There is new information about Boise woman Gwen Brunel, who's been missing since June. Now, searchers say they found her boots near Sucker Creek in Oregon, where her vehicle and shirt were last found. The 27-year-old was last seen in Jordan Valley, Oregon, when she purchased gas at the Sinclair station. Yesterday, it was announced that Gwen's boots were found on September 22nd by a search helicopter, near where the Malheur County Sheriff's Office found her t-shirt just 12 days prior. The update says the boots were found 80 yards away from where the t-shirt was found. Search and rescue volunteers also found her abandoned vehicle in the general area just days after she was reported missing. Brunel is 5 foot 7, about 160 pounds, and has brown eyes and brown hair. If you have information, please call the Boise Police Department or the Malheur County Sheriff's Office at the number on your screen, 541-473-5126. You'll soon have a new option if you're trying to fly to the Twin Cities of Minnesota. Boise Airport just added Sun Country Airlines to its offerings, now providing nonstop flights from Boise to Minneapolis. Along with Boise, the airline has also added flights to several neighboring Montana airports. The service won't ramp up just yet. Flights are set to start next summer and will only run seasonally in the summer for now. And that's the 411 on the 208. I'm Morgan Romero.
Pretty amazing, even with the clouds on Saturday morning, we still got some really nice views of that annular solar eclipse. I know we've been hoping for skies more like this. That's what's outside right now. Barely a cloud out there, plenty of wind today. And even with a 10 degree cool down compared to yesterday, still pretty comfortable, 71 degrees in the city of trees right now. These are the current temperatures for the rest of the region. 73 out in Ontario, upper 60s for Mountain Home, out towards the Magic Valley and low 60s for Stanley and Haley. So pretty pleasant, still warmer than average, but this is how much colder we are compared to yesterday. So a good 10 to 12 degrees less warm in the Magic Valley. All of that behind that cool front that came through last night. It was a pretty uneventful front. We just have that wind left in its wake. The good news is we're briefly cooler today. Then we get this strong ridge of high pressure that will warm us up all the way into the weekend. Here's that seven day forecast by Thursday and Friday flirting with 80 degrees again in Boise. Our next cool down comes in though early next week.
We got a lot of comments today about uh, Congressman Mike Simpson's vote against Jim Jordan for Speaker of the House, like this one from uh, Lauren Meridian. Who's watching Dorothy Moon and her cohorts? That's a more important question. My concern isn't with Simpson, it's with Moon and her group who represent themselves as the only real, true Republican Party. They sure aren't representing this lifelong Republican. A couple more saying that this is what they really wanted as a constituent of Mike Simpson. He correctly vo voted by this constituent's desire, says Mark. Into, uh, we've got a couple more of those. I emailed Mike Simpson, says Michael C., thanking him for the way he voted in the first round of the Speaker of the House. He certainly represents my sentiments. A lot more of these coming through. I won't go through all of them, but Simpson, uh, another thank you for voting against Jim Jordan. As an election denier and supporter of January 6th actions, he should not be third in line for president, says Terry. This one, thank you, Congressman Simpson. Your voice represents your constituents. Dorothy Moon represents the extreme right, and it's burned down the House actions. That's Bill, who's also a proud Idahoan. And ending on this one, is there definitive proof that Dorothy Moon is actually a quagga mussel? An invasive species. I'm leaning that way, says Beckett in Twin Falls. Interesting question. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>